I had interviewed the alcoholics recently. <laughs> and J. Rowe from the alcoholics mentioned. You interviewed uh, Freeway Rick. Yeah. And at the time, I was talking to him on the phone every day. He yeah, was calling he was me calling, yeah, he was calling, calling oh, me. Yeah, he's calling Oh, he was already locked up at the time. To, yeah, we were supposed to sign to him. Oh, he had a record label. Okay. And I never, <laughs> I never um, forget this because I remember the day I had to come home and tell him we were signing with Loud. And I was like nervous. Like, oh, man. you had to call him on the phone from in <laughs> no, jail? No, he would call, he would call me. Him. Oh. Collect from. from <laughs> well, what the, happened was he was out. At first, and when we was winning mm -hmm. him out, and then he got went back in. He was in. He went back. He went back in. He's, right. He's in. He's in prison. Right. So he's calling me every day. Yep. And then, cause Tila King T hooked it up, and so um, he calls me, and I'm like, "Yo, Rick, you know." He's like, "I already know. It's all good, you know." My blessings to you, man. Yeah, okay. I wish I was a little more ready. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come to find out, years later. We were supposed to be the first death row. But you were actually cool with it. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm like this here. I don't, I don't really hate on nobody. And I don't feel that I should hold you down. And I felt that was an opportunity for them, even though uh, the way it went down. Fate was even terrified, too, hmm. that, that, he, that he did that. Uh, let me tell you what happened. How that, how that, Because had I not went to the hole... The deal never would have took place because I would have already had him sign and 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 been able to do the deal the way it was supposed to go down in the first place. But uh, one of my friends had went to the hole and it was a, a, a counselor and, and I who didn't like each other. So my partner was yelling out of the the hole for me to call his girl and tell her he was in the hole so he couldn't make phone calls. Well, anyway, this counselor grabbed me and put me in the hole for thirty days. So that means I couldn't communicate. And when I got out the hole. They were signed, you know. Uh, okay. So when I, when they told me that they were signed, I was a little upset, but not to the point to where I'm gonna like you know call the homies and say, man, go out holler at them dudes. You know, I I wasn't gonna do that. You know, I, I'm not that type of person. You know, what I would I would make that kind of call. I wished them well. Um, and and Fade, you know, he was he was a little nervous too when he talked to me again about it. And when he first told me though, he 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 was, I could hear the excitement in his voice. He was like, "Man, you know, I got the alcoholic signed." And I was like, "You got the alcoholic signed? What you mean?" Um, so anyway, we got over it, you know. And when I got home, Fade took me because uh, Fade was at Interscope then, so he took me up, introduced me to Jimmy. You know, in between those six months. Jimmy Iveen. Jimmy Iveen, yeah. Because yeah. uh, at that time, he was at Interscope, uh, uh, head promoter at Interscope. So uh, he was doing really well. Uh, so he was trying to make up for what he had did with the alcoholics. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> that was my group. Uh, and I got the idea from from from, from Harry on Shook, you know. Me and Harry was with Selly. We were Selly's when they started Death Row. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so were you involved in Death Row though? I should have been involved with Death Row. Um, Harry O had promised me uh, a piece of the label, um, but when I got out, because I got out before Harry O, Harry O was still in, so he was calling me every day. He's still in now, right? He's still in now. I think yeah. he has about another seven or eight years. Okay. I don't know that him and Suge done fell out, so. I run into Suge at Soul Train uh, at Soul Train one day. Uh, uh, um, somebody called me and said Snoop and, and Jermaine Dupree was at Soul Train. My boy used to be the producer of Soul Train, Reggie Relifer. Um So he called me and said, hey, Snoop is down here. So I pop up, Snoop is there, but Suge comes in later. And so, you know, me and Suge knew each other from the visiting room downtown MDC, uh, L.A., when he used to come in and see Harry. Oh, I used to be in the meetings with him. Him, David Kenner, and all of them. I remember when Harry told David Kenner uh, that he's going to show him how to make more money than he ever made at uh, at the law business. I was right there in the in the, in the attorney room with him. Um, so Shug showed me love, you know, like, what's up, homie? What you want to do? You know, woo, woo, woo. So the next day, when Harry calls me, I was like, yeah, I ran into your boy Shug down at what's the name? Because I've been trying to get Harry to, to, to hook me in with Shug. Because, you know, Suge was starting to do good. 
Um, and then Harriet was like, oh, man, stay away from that dude. And in the drug business, if it's your customer, it's disrespectful for me to go and deal with your customer behind your back. Okay. So I respected his wishes, and I backed up off of Shook instead of going on and working with Shook. Okay. When you think of Shook's current situation, what's your take on it? Oh, man, it's bad. You know, uh, Terry was a friend of mine. I've been knowing Terry since, oh, really? I, was, okay. since I was about 18 years old. You know, mm-hmm. Terry OG Lowrider. Yeah. Um, and that's how my whole uh, street life started at Church's Chicken, you know, Lowrider. And so uh, I was saddened to hear that, that, uh, that Terry had gotten killed like that. And uh, But I know that Chuck didn't, wouldn't have tried to kill, not Terry. You know, um, I'm sure he looked up to Terry like so many other people. Yeah, I mean, they came together. To to the to the Tam's parking lot. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, yeah. I don't really know the whole story, yeah. you know, but I just know the 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 kind of clout that Terry had in in the hood, and you know, he's an OG, you know, uh, yeah. him him and Big Putin, you know, I knew Big Putin too. Matter of fact, Big Putin testified against the sheriffs too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Putin is the founder of Pyru. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Putin is the founder of, of Pyru. He's the guy who. Who put all that on, you know? Uh, uh, when 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 we were downtown at MDCLA, uh, getting ready for trial for the sheriffs, he told me the whole story about how the the, the Bloods got started, you know? Because um, I do remember when the Bloods and the Crips used to play football against each other. I explained that in my book when I was a kid. Uh, but sitting down with Putin, because I never really sit down with Putin. I used to serve him some some you know some some cocaine. Uh, but we had never really sat down and went back over the history. And I was trying to get Putin to write a book, too, uh, um, even when he was in the convalescent home and, and I was still in prison and me and him used to talk. I was like, man, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't die with that information, man. You need to uh, put that in a book. And he was like, ah, because um, I heard he was paralyzed from the waist down. Um, and he was telling me that he just didn't want to do it. You know, he was going to take it with him. Okay. Any other involvement in the music business at all or no? Right now? No, no. I mean, back then. Yeah, I paid for Anita Baker's first album. Okay. I was... I played tennis, right? So for me playing tennis, my tennis coach used to take me and hit balls with a lot of little young kids. I was 16 years old, but I was little. And and I didn't hit the ball really hard. So what the tennis coach used to do is he would hooked me up with people who had young kids who they were trying to make be pros. So in between one of these gigs, he introduced me to this guy named Otis Smith. I didn't know what Otis Smith did. Only thing I know, Otis paid me $20 an hour at 16 years old. We're talking about 70, 76. I was 16 years old. He was giving me $20 an hour. Plus he would buy me tennis shoes, rackets, and I would go to big, rich country clubs. You know, where they didn't even allow blacks. Um, and he would take me home in a convertible Rolls Royce. So I would pull up in the neighborhood and I'd be in a convertible Rolls Royce. So I didn't know what he did. Well, one day I'm kicking back in Santa Monica, relaxing, you know. I didn't make my, my million dollars that day. And uh, I'm going to go out and just chill by myself. I don't want to be around nobody. i just going to go chill. So uh, they were having a pro-am tournament out at uh, Lincoln Park in Santa Monica. So I'm out there, and I'm sitting in the bleachers, and I look up, and here's one of the little kids that I used to coach. And um, while they're playing, he gets into an argument with another guy. He's going to UCLA, and this other guy is going to Stanford. Where the other guy is about 6'4", 260 pounds, uh, looks like a middle linebacker. And then not only that, he had this whole rest of his teammates with him who were Looked like about the same size, and it's about eight or nine of them, and they all like banging on on little Otis and his dad, who was Otis, the guy who used to buy me tennis shoes and rackets and so forth. So uh, I'm sitting there, I'm saying, man, this this gonna be ugly. And uh, I can't fight them guys with them. I can't jump in and help Otis. So I I got on my phone and I called my guys. I said, man, it's like eight white guys out here finna jump on me. And, man, it was, seemed like like 10 minutes. <laughs> like 10 minutes, I saw my guys just coming over the fence and, and, and the whole nine yards. And 
as soon as I see them, the guy who was having a match, he just hauled off and he hit Otis right in the eye. Pow! I mean, I saw the, the water skeet out of Otis's eye and, and, you know, Otis was an older guy. At that time, Otis might have been about 60 years old. So my guys looked at me and I was just like, yeah, take care of that. So my guys jumped on, it was, a, it was a brawl and I went down and broke it up after, you know, after a little bit and uh, run the guys, run my guys off, they took off. And so we standing around and then the tennis coach tell Otis that I'm Little Rick from back in the days who he used to pay the $20. And then he also explains to him, uh, well, well, no, Otis is telling Coach Smith that he should invest some money into the music business. He's holding his eye, you know, with, a, with an ice pack on his eye. And he's like, man, I thought you wanted to get in this music business. And so I'm sitting there listening. I'm like, oh, that's what Otis was doing, music. So then Mr. Smith turned around and was like, man, that's what you need to ask to get in the music business is Rick. Uh, he got more money than sin. So uh, then he tell him, he say, and quiet as this kept, Rick probably the one who say, <laughs> say your ass. So uh, Otis turned to me and he's like, huh? He's like, man, come on, I want to take you out for dinner. So we go and eat and he take me up to his office at that time. The record label was Beverly Glenn Music. Uh, he had Johnny Taylor, Bobby Womack. Mm. Um, he had a song, I think, with Patti LaBelle and, and somebody, her comeback album, he was telling me. Well, anyway... He said he had this other girl from Detroit that could sing like a Markenberg. He needed the money to send for her. He needed a place to put her. He needed to produce the album. And da 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 right? And you put up the money. I put up the money. Well, you talked about in an interview, I think, with Hip Hop DX that, that the drug business fu basically funded hip hop. I believe it did, yeah. Yeah. And you said nobody else was going to give us a loan. Nobody was going to... You know, give a young Easy E alone to put out new records, rent a studio, etc. So essentially, the drug business was funding. No stuff. doubt, no question. I mean, even later on, I found out that uh, Dr. Dre learned how to make beats off of Miss Max of Spade. Yeah, King T was telling me when I was in prison. When I was in prison, you know, my ears were more open. So I'm talking to King T on the phone, and he was like, "Yeah, man, you know, Dre uh, used to sit in the window and watch me and Max of Spade make music." Um, Back in the day. So Master Spade used to come to me and get his get his 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 cocaine, his eight tracks when he first started. So um I absolutely believe that the hip hop industry was funded by by the I mean that's why it's so fascinated with drugs. That's why they only talk about drugs in their music, because drugs financed it. Hmm. You know, even Otis with when when I went to Otis's office, Otis had at least three or four gold records hanging on his wall. He had uh, Chapter 8 uh, was signed to him. Um, but he couldn't get any money from nobody. And he turned to me. So hip-hop was almost the same way. Uh, you know, when I finally had met Dr. Dre uh, a few years back, in person, I spoke to him on the phone when I was in prison, but uh, Dre had told me one time, uh, Matt, uh, DJ Pooh had came to me, to uh to do his album and he had took me to this apartment building where all of these guys were laying all out over the floor and uh Dr. Dre said he was in that house that day. Hmm. So I was that close to hip hop and and uh and really just let it slip out my out my fingertips. Right, because I guess you were mentioned on the Above the Law album cover? I was mentioned on Above the Law. Oh, wow. Yeah, right there on the cover, it says, where is Freeway Rick? Yeah, so I, uh, I mean, I'm right there. Rodney on Joe Cooley is working with my guy named Artis from Linwood, who was getting all of his stuff from me. Uh, my other man who was working with Hutch and them. Uh, 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 Hutch from Above the Law. From Above the Law. Call, call uh, 187. Yeah, yeah uh, Ralphie. Ralphie Pettaway was working with Above the Law. So my hand is right there. Uh, 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 even the other guy who owned VIP Records, he was getting his drugs from me. Okay. <laughs> then I had, I had action at the distributors, who was Otis Smith and Dick Griffey. You know, uh, uh, Solar Records. Solar Records. Yeah. You know, I was uh, 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 right there in their office. Dick is one of the ones who talked me out of not doing hip hop 
and doing Anita Baker to give Otis the money instead of giving the money to DJ Pooh. Uh, um, so I, I look back at it and I know that I was right there and I had all that, all the components that I needed. You had all the uh, money. <laughs> all the money that I needed as well. Um, but I just didn't act on it.